I'd like to uh, introduce uh, a buddy of mine, friend of mine, and my granddaughter's husband, uh, Travis Hazelwood. He's one of the Wood Boys. I think you know everyone else. Get on board, 
It's the old ship of Zion. It will never pass this way again. As I step on board, I'll be sing the last verse again. <laughs> Listen right here. As I step on board, I'll be leaving. Amen. All my troubles and trials I'll leave behind. Be yeah. You know, Amen. we have troubles and trials all the time here on this earth, but right. they will be no more. Amen. That's right. I'll be safe with Jesus the That's captain, right. sailing out on the old ship of Zion. Amen. Won't that be a blessing? Hey, Let's sing the last verse hey. again. As I sail on board, I'll be leaving all my troubles and trials be Seas obey. He's 
the one who sails with me. He's the master of the sea. song so we we talk about love and a lot of you see on television talking about love 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 but so many people are missing what love is all about love is when Jesus came down and loved us loved us on the cross loved us in the grave and loved us as he rose Loved us as he ascended, and he's loving us still. And he's going to take us home to be with him because he loved us. You know, I want to thank Brother Travis for sticking around, for coming back, or Amen. he done something to be here this morning. We got together for church and tried to get a few songs together. And I appreciate him. I just want to tell him to his face. This boy can sing tenor. I wish he lived across the street. <laughs> I, think he, I think he needs to change his address. Yeah, I you? think he does too. You, too yeah. you know, Ruthetta, I went up to the bedroom the other day, and she, oh, she's clapping, and she's so happy. And uh, uh, Purifoy, is it? Purifoy that writes music. Um, in fact, uh, Jim Lumpkin down in Morristown was talking to him, and he knows this fellow. He wrote this piece, and it's going to be performed at Carnegie Hall. And he did uh, a solo in it down in Knoxville with the symphony. And they called him, and they said they want him to sing that particular song at Carnegie Hall. Yes. Yeah. 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 You know, I appreciate people that just like Travis. When we asked him to sing Wednesday night, come and sing, he didn't even hesitate. And then when it's worked out to come this morning, he didn't hesitate to get right in here and get something together and I appreciate people like that people's dedicated you know it don't matter if you, somebody needs a floor cleaned in the church or trash picked up they jump right in and get it it's dedication and I thank God for people like that I've, you know I've seen people walk over trash and never pick it up that's right wait for somebody else to do it but I thank God for people that just step out and, and want to help and want to help do what God wants them to do help do his work because he loved me On a hill 
call Calvary. Jesus, my Lord, suffered for me, carried the cross all the way, my sins to atone. Then they nailed him to the cross, great was the pain and the loss, he suffered it all, because he loved me, because he loved me. was crucified no greater love by mortal man has ever been known oh praise his dear name he loves me so now I am his he's mine I know he suffered it all because he loved me because he loved me No greater love by mortal man has ever been known. Oh, praise his dear name, he loves me so. Now I am his, he's mine, I know. He suffered it all, he suffered it all, because he loved me. Savior died on the cross was crucified. No greater love by mortal man has ever been known. Oh, praise his dear name, he loves me so. Now I am his, he's mine, I know. He suffered it all because he loved me. Brings our message this morning. All right, good to be in the house of the Lord, and appreciate you being here today. And you chose uh, Freedom Fellowship to come and and uh, to be with us. Turn that off if you don't, boys. Don't care. I don't need it. Amen. <laughs> uh, when I was in the prison ministry, they'd hear me walking down the uh, down the corridors. And they said, there comes the sound of thunder. In other words, they said, there's come big mouth. Good to be here, isn't it? Amen. Amen. It even is a better thing that the, the Lord is here. Amen. He had a little blessing to us yesterday. The big orange road. <laughs> We're thankful for that. So, uh, I know it's wrong, uh, but I was doing some heavy praying yesterday. Uh, huh? No, they've converted me. <laughs> uh, running with the Sloan twins. They've rubbed off on me. Uh, but I'm still a Tech fan too. It's good to be here, isn't it? I'm glad that we can laugh and cut up and carry on and, and all that other good stuff. I'm not going to wear this jacket. And uh, as you all know, I'm prone to sweat from time to time. Let's stand and 
going to hold our Bibles high today. Amen. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I'm justified by faith. Saved by grace. Kept by the Holy Spirit. Washed in His blood. Greater that's He that's in me. That's He that's in the world. I'm more than a conqueror. Through Christ. Which strengthens me. I'm heaven bound. With the hammer down. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Alright church. There was more come in than I thought that was going to make it today. I praise God for that. I've already made a promise to the Lord a long time ago. Whether there was 500 or... Or five, I was still going to preach as hard as I ever did. I remember when I was a young evangelist for about four years. There was a little old church over in Virginia, Rye Cove. It was me and the pastor and two other folk. And I didn't cut nothing. I kept on preaching. And so I think it's going to take God's word and God's spirit. The Lord to move us tonight. Ezekiel chapter 37. I want to look at some re- uh, at the restoration and the restoring and the uh, resurrection, not only in the prophetic sense of Israel, but also in the practical sense of God's people. He said, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the valley in, of the valley which was full of bones. And caused me to pass by round about them. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said, Son unto me, Son unto, and he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. That's a good question, ain't it? Amen. And he again he said unto me, Prophesy to these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter unto you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 8. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, and bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews of the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them about, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, oh, breathe, and breathe, and, and breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded unto me, And the breath came unto them, and they lived, and stood up their feet in an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, and our hope is lost, and we're cut off for our parts. Amen. In the previous chapters, if you would read the book of Ezekiel, it was prophesied of the judgment to come. He prophesied that the glory of the Lord would not only leave the land and leave the people, but he would leave the temple. It was a time of judgment. And it was a time of judgment because of disobedience. And disobedience leads to distance, and distance leads to dryness. But when we come to Ezekiel chapter number 37, amen, we are confronted with hope. I'm thankful that God don't leave us in the times of judgment. I'm glad that God will always bring us hope. And he's telling them that they have a future, that it's not over for them. I want to say to everybody here today, I don't care how uh, far that you may have gone back on God, there's hope for you today. There is a power of resurrection and of restoration waiting for you this morning. I'm glad that God does not leave us Amen tonight in that time of despair. 
In fact, in verse 11, if you'll notice with me, they even confessed that they were without hope. Amen. And they were cut off from their parts. In other words, they seemed like there was no moving there. But aren't you glad that God is able to cause, call those things which are not as though they already are? He said, if you'll just do this, I'll do that. And you're going to see a resurrection and a restoration to the children of Israel. Amen. So what we're seeing here, it is prophetic. I'm not going to try to take that out of the way. But it's also practical in application. So the first thing I want us to look at is the bones uh, that he was talking about in verses 1 through 4. And the hand of the Lord is upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. Now I don't know if this was a literal valley or not or whether this was just a vision. I, am, I have my proclivities that says that it was a vision that God had sent him. I don't know what it was, but I do know the scene. I know that he saw a valley full of bones. Amen? And they were swiveled up, and they were dried up. And he, he saw that they were just not a few bones, but a, a lot of bones. So point number one under the bones, I want you to see that he is making a comparison here. He is comparing the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, as dried up bone. Now what is a dried up bone? It is a relic of something that used to be alive. Amen? They used to have life in them. Uh, we were talking about the body farm yesterday. I said, I don't want to go down to the body farm. I don't want to be around that deadness. Amen? Because the body farm indicates that decaying of the body, the decaying of the flesh that once had life within it. That body that's laying there once breathed, once lived, once moved. He is comparing the Israelites to just dried up dead bones. Amen? Uh, we can place a practical application to everything concerning things that used to be alive. But Ecclesiastes says, I'd rather be a live dog than a dead lion. In other words, I'd rather be alive and well and have hope than something that used to have life and used to have hope and used to be glorious, but is now dead. I'm glad I'm, hallelujah, got breath in me. That there's hope for me and hope for you and hope for this nation and hope for this country and hope for our families and hope, amen, tonight for our schools and our children, amen. amen. And so, so the, in verse number two, the Bible said, and he caused me to pass by them round about. In other words, he lets him see the seriousness of the matter at hand. Come on now. The first charge is that he gets him to see a fresh view of how bad it really was. And God's always worked this way, church. When, when, when he brought Nehemiah up on the city and he let him see just how bad that the wall had been destroyed, Nehemiah had no idea just how bad it really was. And I'm going to be honest with you, I think there's a lot of people in this world doesn't really know how bad it really is. We need a fresh vision and a fresh touch to see just how depraved that men have become and just how bad that the situation in America and our families and our homes have come. We need a fresh vision. Amen? It was Paul who passed through Athens that saw the false gods there. It was Jesus himself that cried over Jerusalem and said, Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, how often would I gather you together as a hen would gather chicks? Yeah. Even Jesus saw how bad it is. I think a lot of good homes have sheltered themselves in, in themselves and have forgotten just about how bad things are. Come on. Talk to me now. 
Why do we need a fresh vision? Because we've been desensitized. We've been desensitized. We need to look again to see again how dead and how dry our circumstances are. I, 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 my mind went back when I was preparing for this this week. Now look up here. Pay attention to me. I remember my granddaddy getting bent plumb out of shape when they started legalizing beer and liquor by the drink. And he even said, I'm not going to them grocery stores that, that buy beer or sell beer. It wasn't long, though. <laughs> he got desensitized to it. And there he goes to Food City and Oakwood and amen to all those stores. Amen, because we have just accepted it as the way of life. Have we not? Come on. I remember when I was growing up, hee-haw was a sin to watch. <laughs> Come on. I mean, my mamma says, you're not watching that field. Well, I'm going to tell you something right now. That's a fairy tale compared to what we got now. <laughs> Amen. And I even myself catch myself from time to time, amen, flipping through the channels and be desensitized to all the filth, amen, and all the, 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 the grammar and all the violence and all of that. I find myself not bothering me like it used to. God's got a hold of me this morning. He looked at it and he said, this is a valley of dry bones. So, so the question in hand is the characteristics of the bones. What are we seeing? How can I place a practical application on the bones? How can I look at it in a practical way? Well, number one, one of the characters is the, is the degrading or the falling of the family. It's nothing for families. To live without love, without relationship, without communication, amen, without care. Even in marriage today, listen to me, I mean, there is no loyalty anymore. Uh, the little wife burns the beans and I'm headed out the door. People are looking for different uh, ways of doing things. I'll well, tell you something right now. Used to be families were loyal to one another. Oh, come on now. I look at our schools today. And Brother Mark, I know you remember this. Now, y'all went to Fairview. I went to Clinchport. And we had prayer every morning. The principal would pray over the intercom every morning. We'd have preachers come in. If there was revival in the town of Clinchport, they would come and they would hold services. There. Let the ACL do anything with that. Amen. Come on. I can remember when we had Bible study in schools. You know what we got now? America said we don't want that religious bunch in there. We don't want those Bible thumpers in there. We don't want those Holy Ghost filled people in there. And we're going to keep them out of our schools. And the results of it is that we're having shootings and killings, amen, and murders and thieves and thugs. And our children don't even feel safe anymore at school because they're being bullied. Amen. I will say this to you tonight. When God had preeminence in our schools, we didn't have that problem. Amen. <laughs> we become a relic. If you took them back, even as back as far as Brother Frank's generation, we would not even recognize the school system of the day. And even our churches today, we have gotten away, and I'm not here beating the good folk here to this morning. I'm proud of you. I love you. I think we got a vision here. Amen. Amen. I think we're on track. Amen. But I think that we forgot about our vision, what a lot of folks have. And our vision is to win lost souls for God. This is not about 
the music that we play or the, the activities that we have. And I believe in all that. But if we lose the very fact of what we're here for, and that's to see old sinners come to Jesus Christ, get washed in the blood of the Lamb, we have forgotten the mission of Almighty God. Amen? What happens is we lose our identity. And we become a social club. Amen? Listen to me. I'd rather have these 60, 70 people here today as a bunch of fakers. Come on. I'd rather have these 60, 70 folks here that love God or seeking God, wanting God to bless their home, than a bunch of fakers or drug addicts and thieves and thugs. I'd rather have them who are looking for the movement of God. Woo! Boy, I got, uh, got me stirred up a little bit. What has happened is that the church has begun to look like the world. I'm not talking about the clothes you wear, but I'm talking about how that we act or how that we operate. I, I get this all the time. You need to operate like Eastman operates. Let me say, <laughs> woo! I believe in being organized, but listen to me. The church is a living organism. We don't operate as the world operates. We operate according to a higher power and an authority. We operate through the economy of grace and the divine nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are called to be a city set upon a hill. We don't hear much about separation anymore, do we, church? Amen? We are to be separate. Be separate. Come out from among the world. Come on now. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. Now, I'm not talking about separating yourself from the world and being a coming a hermit. You can sin being a hermit just as much as you can sin, amen, living amongst thousands and thousands of people. If you don't believe me, ask Martin Luther, the great reformer. Martin Luther, the great reformer, stood in a field naked as a jaybird for 40 days and 40 nights, didn't eat, and prayed and prayed and prayed and found out that he was just as sinful doing that as he was when he was around everybody else. <laughs> Separation comes in is that we operate at a different level when you're empowered by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let, let me, even in our individual lives, now I can honestly talk about me personally here, okay? I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me. There's times I have become dry upon the Lord. And that excitement has died down. Why well, once, I can remember a time when I first got saved and got born again. Why well, you can mention Jesus and I'd shout her out. And over the years, through troubles and trials and circumstances and the weight and heavy of burdens, something like something has been drawn away from me. And I'm here to tell you it does not keep me from pursuing him. Oh, I'm their hope for us, church. And if God once touched us once, thank God and filled us with the Holy Ghost once, amen, He can fill it again. Amen. Here, here's what I see. Be with me now. We're living on what used to be. Come on. I hear this all the time. The used to be revival. Amen. Way it used to be. I'm going to say this to you. I don't know about you. I don't need to be living in what used to be. I got a now and now to deal with. I got a, a, a present devil to deal with. I got a present flesh to deal with. I need a touch of God now. I need a fresh touch of God now. I need a good drink of water now. Now all these naysayers say, well, we ain't never going to see no revival. Amen. You ain't never going to see no revival with that pessimistic attitude. You know what got a hold of me with this, boys? Just that little comment. On the radio yesterday, they was talking about our victory over South Carolina. When they got talking about Alabama, they said, that ain't going to happen. 
And that Revere's guy, the guy that kicks, he said, wait a minute, the game ain't even been played yet. Listen to me. Woo-hoo! My field got here. There's a lot of you giving up before the game's been even played. Oh, Lord have mercy. Oh, you got to play the game. Stick with God. So here was the concern in verse number 3 about the bones. And he said, Son unto me, said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord, thou knowest. Come on. He asked him a good question. Can they live again? He had a good answer. I don't know. You said, Preacher, do you know how this is going to turn out? I don't know. But I know this. I'm going to stick with him. (laughs) You know, it's like Peter. When he asked Peter, he said, Are you going to leave me too? The Lord Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Hey, Peter, are you going to leave too? There's many walking away from me right now. It was in the last half year of his life. When he got down time to to, to the (laughs) nitty-gritty. I'll let me preach here. You can always tell when somebody's going to stick with you if they stick with you through the nitty gritty. Amen. It's easy to stick with somebody when everything's going good and going well. Amen. But when it comes down to problems and troubles and trials, it's those that stick around. When you're in the fire and in the trouble and in the trial, those are the ones that you can say, they're going to stick with me. Hallelujah. Can these bones live again? Yes, they can. Why is that? Because we got a God can do anything. I'm not giving up on, on the hope of the, our churches around in, in, in our areas. Amen? I know we don't have the preeminence and the prominence and the power that we used to have. I know that. I know that we've lost some of that stigma. I'm here to tell you, don't give up on the church. Hallelujah. I'm not going to jump ship. Amen. On the church. They sung that old ship of sign. I will keep riding her out. Woo! I got another thing. That <laughs> come right from God. If I'm in a storm, you think I'm going to jump ship? There's, even though the storm beating the boat and rocking the boat, buddy, there's safety on the boat. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? See, the, uh, the boat only goes down when you let what's on the inside or the outside get on the inside. Come on. I tell you, right? See, boats were made for sailing. And this old ship's been sailing a long time. And it's been through some storms. It's been through some persecutions. It's been through some heartaches. Thank God the old ship of signs always come through. And it will come through again. Amen. Oh, bless his holy name. Then, secondly, we see the breath. Verse 34. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of God. Thus said the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Now if you'll notice over in verse number 7, And he prophesied as he was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together both to his bones. Now here's what I want you to get. It starts, life starts, by the preaching of God's Word. Come on. I love music. I appreciate Sherry the Good Choir. I appreciate these men singing. But there's a lot of folks who think that you can build a church upon music without the preaching. God never has ordained music to build a church. <laughs> 
The church, uh, the music can get you out, but the Word of God will keep you out. Woo! Amen. I want you to notice this. He said, preach, prophesy to them. Now, they didn't have any life whatsoever, amen, tonight in that valley. They were dead, dried up, dis distinct, no hope for them at all until he began to preach the word. Now, I tell this all the time. I remember when I was first called to preach, I'd get out in the tree. Out in the woods somewhere. Find me a stump. And I'd open my Bible. And I'd preach. <laughs> he said, well, Brother Roy. He said, Them, I've had, had this question asked. Said, well, they wasn't listening to you. I said, I got a, a, a better response out of them trees. A lot of times I did a lot of folk. <laughs> Amen. He, every now and then the wind would blow. And the leaves would fluff a little bit. <laughs> Come on. But God is saying that there's to, to Ezekiel and something to us this morning that there's power in the Word of God in the preaching of God's Word. Romans chapter number 1 verse 16 and 17 I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation unto them that believe first. Jew first and also to the Greek. Power of God. Look up at me now. This blessed old book, it has power in it. It has power to save. It has power to sanctify. It has a power to sustain us. How many times have you been in a dire strait with, fear, with, with tears flowing down your face not knowing what to do. And God led you to the Word of God and gave you a sustaining strength. Oh. Here's what I found out about revivals. I studied revivals when I was going through my, my doctorate. One of the things we had to study was on revivals. One of the things about every great revival was there was hard strong preaching that led folk to Christ. Whether we're talking about the Whitfields or the Wesleys or the Jonathan Edwards, every great movement began by the preaching of God's Word. Amen. Now, that's why folks want to do with, away with preaching. Come on. I know one preacher that told me about a month or two ago said they want me to cut my time from 30 minutes of preaching to 10 minutes. He said, I can't even get wound up in 10 minutes. He said, I can't even get my introduction. They want to cut the time. And I want to say, I want to brag on church here this morning. I want to thank God that you've given me the liberty to preach. There's never been a time that I've ever seen anybody look at their clock and say, it's time to go. Amen? I will appreciate that and that liberty. Then they want to change our subject matter. Amen. Don't get into any of the controversial stuff. Don't preach against sin. Don't preach against the gay movement, the liberal movement. Don't preach it, uh, anything that's going to cause a rift. <laughs> Come on. You all ain't preachers. We go through this. Amen? I had one fellow try to tell me that I didn't need to get off on certain subjects. Thank God he's gone. <laughs> Amen? I'm going to tell you right now, I have never been to the persuasion of men. I have never listened to what men have told me I could do or what I could not do. Listen, I was discouraged before I ever come to Christ and I'd be daggone am I going to be discouraged when I'm in Christ. Amen. 
But there's a problem here. Pray on, Bob. I need it. <laughs> there is a problem. If you look at verse number 7, he says, Son of man, these, uh, behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost and we're cut off from our parts. Verse 8. Oh, no way. Verse 8. Then I went, and when I beheld, I saw a prophesied. Verse 7. And so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. Now listen to verse 8. This is where I want to lay my head right for a minute. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Verse 9, Then saith he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. Here's where I want to go. Look up here. The problem was it takes more than just God's word to revive. Amen? This word breath is the Hebrew word for rock. It simply means spirit. Prophesy to the spirit and let the spirit breathe upon them. Amen. See, see, we can have all kinds of preaching and we can have all kinds of Bible study and you can go to all the conferences that there is but if there is no breath, if there's no spirit, it'll not cause life to come upon you. Amen? What, what does the Word of God do? The Word of God brings organization. If you'll notice when he prophesied, they became together. They began to organize. Listen to me. I believe in organization. I don't believe you can operate without being organized. But organization will not bring life. Amen. It's like when the Lord made Adam out of the clay of, the, uh, of dust. All he had there was an organization of a body. It wasn't until he breathed into the body of Adam that he became a living soul. And I'll give you a prime example. Now, I'm not throwing off on any church or any denomination. God help us for doing that. But I notice, I've been in a lot of Presbyterian meetings over the years. they got great doctrine. They do. And they preach God's Word. But there's no life there. They, they, they can tell you how to get saved. And they'll show you how to get saved. But when somebody does get saved, it's like, no big deal. You cannot have a living church without the Spirit of God. This is what I pray every day. Two things. God, give me the Word to feed your people and give me the Spirit, amen, to that, to sink into the heart. Amen. Bless His holy name. So here we see the lesson. It takes more Look up here. It takes more than just hearing the Word of God and receiving God's Word to remove the dryness. In order for it to receive life, you must have God's Word or His Spirit. I can inspire you. I can motivate you. I can encourage you. But it takes the Spirit of the Lord to do anything with God's Word. I can jump, I can shout, I can holler, holler hallelujah. And I can say, amen, my feet look new and my hands do too. But it takes the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me go on. I want to look at the blessing. First up, there is that prophetic blessing. And I believe when we're nearing this prophetic blessing of where God 
is going to restore Israel. Look up here. Don't leave me now. I believe we're, we're nearing this. Amen. First off, it, it deals with two things. Number one, it deals with bringing Israel back as a nation. We've seen that in 1948. Actually, it happened in almost, seemed like a day. They were restored. They were restored their land. They were restored physically as a nation. But thank God there's going to come a day that they're going to be restored spiritually. And it'll be in that day, after the seven-year tribulation period, that when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will rise out of, right out of heaven with his vesture dipped in blood, singing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, at that moment, Zechariah tells us that they'll call upon their Messiah. What a blessing. You know what that really tells me, church? That God's grace, even as disobedient and rebellious as Israel has been over the years, at a moment's notice, when they cry out upon the Lord, God's grace will come on the sea. Let me ask something. If God can do that to Israel, cannot God's grace come upon us today? Cannot God's favor come upon us today? No. Where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. Then we look at the practical. You know what's going to give life to every church, just not ours? But to every church, His Word, our prayers, and His Spirit. There's three things that are needful in the house of God today. His Word, His Spirit, and our prayers. Our prayers move his heart in order to move his hand. I have never seen a time when God's people got desperate for him that God didn't ever did, he, that he never did move. He always moves from a desperate heart. Do you not know sometimes that God gets us in a position that we need him? See, I'll never know that Jesus, we sing this song all the time, Jesus is all I need. You'll never know that Jesus is all you need until he's all you got. Amen. And sometimes he'll back us up into the corner and say, all the, the other stuff's not working. Your, your plans are not working. Your organization's not working. Why don't you try it my way? You know what was prevalent in the early church? His word, his prayer, and his spirit. That's what we need. Amen. And I'm going to say this to you. I know we've had our ups and downs in the last three, four months. It's been tough. I'm still glad I'm not in a dead church. Me and Jason was talking about it today. I'd rather have God's Spirit in a place than I would to have a whole congregation of folks. Does a pastor get discouraged? Especially, a pastor gets discouraged, especially if he's mission minded like me. I'm mission minded. I like going out and getting them. I like seeing the house full. I like seeing people getting helped and fixed. But if you don't have his spirit, if all you got is emotionalism, come on. I had one pastor tell me one time, he said, I'd rather have, amen, tonight a wildfire than, than nothing at all. I said, not me. Wildfire never stand. Emotionalism comes and goes. I believe you ought to have emotionalism when the spirit of the Lord comes. I'm not going to have emotionalism just to have emotionalism just because we don't want it to be quiet. Come on. I believe in worshiping God, but I believe you ought to be worshiping God when the worshiper comes. Amen? <laughs> Woo! 
That right there, that's good preaching, preacher. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something, church. I've been in a lot of battles. There's one thing that's always prevalent. God's always brought me through. This is not a new thing to me. And it ought not be a new thing to you. I want to encourage you. Stick with the Lord. Stick in His house. Stick with His Word. Let's begin to pray. Amen? In fact, we're going to have start having some personal, private prayer meetings where the church just comes. We're going to walk around this place and pray and seek God's face, anoint everything. A lot of times you'll find me here anointing and praying everything. God can help us today. God can help us. Play. I don't care what situation you're in this morning. There's help for you today. I have two special people in my heart this morning. Terry's daughter, son-in-law. I've been praying all week. God bring them to the breaking point. I'm not talking about just coming up to the edge of it and looking at it. I'm talking about pure despair. Where they don't have any other choice but to look to Jesus. That's when you get saved. Hey, that's when the backslider eventually says, I can't do this no more. Can't handle it no more. God has to bring you to the place of desperation. I wonder if anybody would like to come this morning and you've got somebody on your heart and mind that you want to pray for. Amen. Something that you got that you want to have life about. Maybe you're in a dead relationship. Maybe your family life is dead. Maybe mom and dad are dead spiritually and you'd like to have help this morning God has help for you let's begin to cry out for the lost to be saved again <coughs> oh father today we love you Lord I'm praying heavenly father for Lee and Donnie Jesus I'm asking you, Lord, today to stir the waters of their soul. Oh, God, I pray, Lord, that they'll see that they need Jesus. Oh, I know that Lee is prideful. I know she's stubborn. And I know she's rebellious. Oh, but Lord, today I know that there's a place in her heart that longs to be saved. Lord, I'm asking you tonight, oh God, Lord, to save them. Oh, that little gem, I have a mom and dad, Lord, that will serve the Lord and dedicate her to you and their life to you. God, help our families, help our children that are living in families that are depraved, living in families that are wrong. we got children that are living with drug addicts and alcoholics, abuse, children that have to do with that. Children themselves are being abused. Lord, I ask you, Lord, to protect them. Oh, Jesus, move on the situation. Save them, I pray. Save those parents. Father, today watch over us. Place your hand upon the church. Breathe life unto us again. Lord, send an old-time revival, a restoration of God. I praise you, and I love you. In Jesus' name we